Sorry for the extra delay. I had a uh, had a problem with one of my slides, and sometimes it's hard to find those problems and get them fixed. Uh, and if you're uh, used to using PowerPoint, you may know what I'm talking about. But I got it fixed, and you got to watch me fix it there at the, at the very beginning. But that's not why we're here. You're not here to learn how to do PowerPoint. You're not here to watch me fix PowerPoint problems. Um, in this video, I want to share with you some information about what I consider the most common, the most dangerous workplace toxins. Now there are, again, hundreds, thousands of workplace toxins that uh, uh, could possibly occur in different workplaces, but the ones that I'm going to focus on are some that I've mentioned already uh, in passing. Uh, but again, these are the, uh, these toxins cause the bulk of chemical related fatalities in the workplace. We're talking about acute fatalities. Uh, acute meaning with immediate exposure, the person who is exposed is in immediate danger uh, and could die in that moment basically. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first workplace toxin I want to talk about is one that we probably all take for granted because we've all heard about it. We've all heard of carbon monoxide and the dangers of carbon monoxide. We probably have carbon monoxide detectors in our homes, or at least I hope you have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. Uh, there are hundreds of fatalities each year, not just in the workplace, but uh, all over the United States, workplace, uh, at home, and, and other locations as well uh, where people die from carbon monoxide exposure. But carbon monoxide is a chemical asphyxiant. It combines with the blood hemoglobin during gas exchange in the alveoli. It interferes with the blood cells ability to carry oxygen. Hemoglobin, by the way, is the component of the blood which is normally going to be carrying that oxygen uh, uh, to all of the different tissues in the body that need oxygen to survive. And that's pretty much every tissue in the body uh, needs oxygen to survive. But when carbon monoxide combines with the hemoglobin, there's no room for the oxygen and the blood cell. And what's happening here, another substance is being developed. The carbon monoxide and the hemoglobin combine to form carboxyhemoglobin. And carboxyhemoglobin, once it gets attached to those blood cells, no room for the oxygen. And hemoglobin has a great affinity for carbon monoxide. Or you can say it in more simple terms, maybe, maybe not entirely correct terms, hemoglobin really loves carbon monoxide. And uh, hemoglobin is a great carrier for carbon monoxide and carboxyhemoglobin that forms. And when that happens, there's no, there's no oxygen being carried 
through our bloodstream to the tissues that need that oxygen. Uh, carbon monoxide is the result of incomplete combustion of carbon-based fuels. It could be gasoline, could be diesel, could be wood, plastics, pretty much, really pretty much anything in our homes, in our workplaces that involves combustion or burning, fire, is going to be producing a carbon monoxide. That's why it's such a great idea. I think it's a necessity to have carbon monoxide detectors in the home. Um, in the workplace, one of the, one of the primary sources of carbon monoxide would be the internal combustion engines that are used in many industries. These internal combustion engines, uh, burning gasoline or diesel fuel or, fuel, or maybe, maybe other fuels as well, maybe uh, liquefied petroleum gas, vehicles may be set up to run uh, uh, LPG. Um, but any of those engines that are burning those types of fuels will produce as a byproduct carbon monoxide. Uh, in the construction industry, one of my biggest concerns was anywhere that we had a water pump running, talking about an internal combustion engine powered water pump, a water pump running, or a generator running. Uh, small engines, lawnmower size engines, it may be bigger than your average lawnmower engine, but anytime you had these, these small internal comb combustion engines running, carbon monoxide was being, was being produced. And a lot of times these small uh, tools, these small engines would end up in really tight areas that did not have good natural ventilation to keep the carbon monoxide uh, blown out of that work area. Uh, multiple times in my career, I've, I've ran into uh, circumstances where workers were working in areas where they should not have been working. And almost invariably, it was because of carbon monoxide coming from a water pump or a generator. Now, there are other sources as well, but those, in my experience, those, those are, are tools we need to watch out for. And also another downside with those small engines, they tend to be less efficient than a lot of engines. Less efficient means more incomplete combustion, more incomplete combustion, more carbon monoxide. In 2018, remember I said at the beginning, we're talking about substances in this unit that account for a, a great number of workplace fatalities. Just looking at the 2018 data, you could look at 2019, 2020, I probably need to update this. But in 2018, looking at data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, carbon monoxide accounted for 44% of the work-related fatalities involving acute chemical exposure. All the chemicals out there in the workplace, you know, the benzenes and the H2S and all these other exotic chemicals that are out, out, in, out in the workplace, um, carbon monoxide was the leading killer as far as acute chemical exposure. That means um, immediate exposure, immediate effects, or relatively speaking, immediate. We're not talking about long-term chronic exposure over 5, 7, 10, 15 years, day after day. Yeah, this is the acute exposure uh, that we talked about earlier in the semester. Uh, it's immediate exposure, immediate effects is what we're talking about. You have 44% of the work-related fatalities involving acute chemical exposure. And it wasn't H2S. H2S takes lives as well. It wasn't some of the other what I call more exotic chemicals. It was simple, old, everyday carbon monoxide, which is extremely dangerous. And part of the reason I think it's extremely dangerous is because it's so common, because we live with it every day. We hear about it uh, almost continually, especially in the winter months when people start using gas or wood stoves to heat their homes. There'll usually be a news story about the dangers of, of carbon monoxide, and there should be. But with these repeated news stories and, and all of the, the information that's out there, we, I think we grow immune to it. We have gr grown immune to it. But we can't. We can't let ourselves get complacent with carbon monoxide. Um, man, I've, I've got more stories I can tell, but I would be here for 30 minutes just on carbon monoxide. We can't do that to you. If you'd like to, to hear more of my experiences in the construction industry where workers have, 
have uh, been exposed to carbon monoxide, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to share those with you. But before we move on to the next substance, let's look at this table over here to the right. We have a table with two columns. In the left column is a carbon monoxide level. In the right column is uh, primarily we have health effects at those different carbon monoxide levels. Now the first row here, 50 parts per million, that's the OSHA 8-hour PEL for carbon monoxide. Uh, but then if we go to 100 parts per million in this row, here's a health effect. At 100 parts per million, it's likely that the worker exposed will develop a slight headache after one to two hours. It's probably not going to uh, be fatal, uh, but a slight headache, not as focused, not producing as well, that's, you know, that, that's not how we want our workers to be at work. Uh, we need to be monitoring, we need to be recognizing uh, carbon monoxide levels that could result in sickness in our workers, even if it's a mild sickness. Uh, but that, and that mild sickness, that 100 parts per million, if we're not monitoring, that could turn into 200 parts per million. Dizziness, nausea, 400 parts per million. Life-threatening in three hours at 400 parts per million. Just four times greater than 100 parts per million, life life-threatening in a few hours. If you have a worker in a confined space and carbon monoxide levels are at 400 parts per million, if they're in there, there's a... And these, these are not absolute values. These are ballparks. These are estimates of the likely health effects. Some people, there are going to be individual differences. Think of these as the, the health effects likely to be experienced by the average person. At 800 parts per million, unconsciousness after one hour, death in two to three hours. 1,600 parts per million, death within one to two hours. Go all the way out to 12,800 parts per million, immediate unconsciousness, death within one to three minutes. This stuff will kill you fast. And relatively speaking, it doesn't take a lot of it. You know, I've taken measurements from... Uh, from generators, water pumps that were well over 400 parts per million. Um, and yeah, once you get, once you, to me really, if we're going to do safety the right way, if we have workers exposed above the action level, the action level for carbon monoxide is 25 parts per million. When you have workers exposed to 25 parts per million or greater, the employer needs to be taking action. And the first step in all of this is to have some type of continual monitoring protocol in place. You need to be monitoring for the presence of carbon monoxide. And I would argue for monitoring in areas wherever there is the potential for carbon monoxide to be produced. Uh, if small internal combustion engines are running, if any internal combustion engines are running, if there are any, uh, if there is any hot work where carbon-based fuels are being burned. Carbon monoxide can be produced. Yeah, you could even broaden that out to any hot work, any kind of hot work where materials are being heated. Even if they're not carbon-based materials, we should be monitoring for carbon monoxide. And one of the nice things about uh, the monitoring devices that are available, uh, most modern monitoring devices, even the, the less expensive monitoring devices, are going to be set up to monitor for carbon monoxide. And we should be monitoring for this extremely dangerous, extremely taken for granted uh, toxic substance. But let's, let's move on to another. Hydrogen sulfide. In Oklahoma, in the oil industry, if you've worked in the oil industry, you hydrogen sulfide is, in, is on your radar. Even if you haven't worked in the oil industry, being in an oil producing area, uh, hydrogen sulfide may be on your radar. Uh, hydrogen sulfide is a gas that is produced when organic matter uh, breaks down, when organic matter decomposes. Organic matter, we're talking about leaves, dead animals, grass, uh, human waste, uh, 
any organic matter as it is decomposing hydrogen sulfide is likely to be produced by that decomposition uh, in addition to the decomposition process that could occur in a storm sewer or could occur in a manure pit in fact I think I've told you this story already it's not my story it was about a year ago uh, some farmers went down to the manure pit and they were overcome by H2S in that manure pit. Manure pit, you have organic matter decomposing, producing H2S. And not just H2S, it's producing other gases as well. Methane, for example, would be produced in that, in that same manure pit. But in addition to this, this kind of decomposition that could be occurring uh, real time, or in the recent past, or as we're talking, as we're, uh, as we're working on a project. We also have what I refer to as ancient H2S deposits. Uh, underground deposits often associated with natural gas or crude oil. When you hear the term sour crude, that's crude with a high sulfur content, smells like rotten eggs, that rotten egg smell, that sulfur content, that goes along with hydrogen sulfide. There are oil fields in Oklahoma. Uh, really, anywhere oil is produced, there are oil fields that have such high levels of hydrogen sulfide that any worker entering those areas, ha they have to be properly equipped. They have to have the monitoring devices. They have to have the respirator, uh, respir respiratory protection before they enter those areas. And the respiratory protection required could be pretty elaborate depending on the, the level of um, exposure, the level of concentration in these areas. I know at least one of our students last summer worked in the oil and gas industry and they had to wear an H2S monitor um, on the job continually and that's what the that's what the really good companies do if there's going to be h2s exposure they provide a a monitor to each worker and one thing you'll notice and we really haven't talked about this it really goes along more with our monitoring and sampling um, unit in the next class but where do you wear these monitors with Normally, we're told to wear the monitors in the breathing zone, up around the face, neck area, the breathing zone. Uh, the zone from where we're drawing air in as we, as we breathe. But with H2S, because it's heavier than normal air, a lot of times you will see workers wear the H2S monitor, maybe even down around their ankles. And, and that is not incorrect because H2S is one of those heavier than air substances that will sink. You may, not, you may not feel it at all up around your face in your breathing zone, but if you bend over, and there may be H2S at a lower elevation, when you bend over, your head goes into that H2S and you could get a whiff of it. And depending on the concentration, that one whiff, or that one breath, could result in immediate effects maybe even as severe as an immediate collapse with that one breath. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, oil and gas uh, producing areas, in addition to manure pits and other areas where you might have decomposing organic materials, storm sewers and also sanitary sewers. A storm sewer is going to collect a lot of the leaves and the dead animals and the grass and it accumulates in those storm sewers. It doesn't all wash out, it accumulates, it decomposes. Hydrogen sulfide can be produced. Sanitary sewers, what we're talking about there, are the sewers that are designed to carry human feces and human urine, human waste. Uh, definitely where you have human waste, uh, feces, urine, there is a, a great potential for hydrogen sulfide to occur. Now, one thing I need to mention, I keep talking hydrogen sulfide and you see H2S here. H2S is the common abbreviation that you'll, you'll hear guys talk H2S this, H2S that. They're talking about hydrogen sulfide. Uh, as a best practice, I recommend anytime 
you enter a confined space, and I know you may not know exactly what we mean by confined space, but for our purposes now, think of it as, as a confined space as an area where you would not want to spend very much time. Uh, one way in, one way out, not good ventilation. It's not some place where you want to hang out. Uh, it's, it, and it is relatively tight, but ventilation, one way in, one way out, is a simple, quick and dirty definition for our purposes of a confined space. Always test for H2S. Always test for carbon monoxide. And that's another good thing about the monitors that I mentioned when I talked about carbon monoxide. Those monitors that test for carbon monoxide, many of them also will test for hydrogen sulfide. You can buy, you can buy gas-specific monitors that just test for one gas, or you can purchase multiple gas monitors or multi-gas monitors. And those multi-gas monitors, they normally will be set up to uh, test for four different uh, uh, conditions, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, the lower explosive limit, usually they're calibrated to methane for that lower explosive limit, and then they're also going to be continually checking for the oxygen level, monitoring the oxygen level in the workplace. And when you take carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, and oxygen, those three, if you can control those in most workplaces, you're going to be, you're going to be ahead of the game. You're, if, if you worked for a company that wasn't doing any of this type of monitoring or providing any of these devices, and you persuaded management to start providing these devices, and you're only testing for those four things, you know, oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, and LEL, lower explosive limit, that's going to be a tremendous improvement in your safety uh, system. Just that simple, that simple little tool, start using that simple little tool, provides a, a great improvement to what your company is doing to protect the safety of its workers. Now I've already mentioned that hydrogen sulfide is characterized by a rotten egg smell. Uh, hydrogen sulfide, like carbon monoxide, combines with, the combines with the iron or the hemoglobin in the blood and interrupts cell respiration. It is also a chemical asphyxiant. But let's look at the exposure levels and the effects. At 0 .000047 parts per million, that's not very much, that's when most people are going to be able to detect that rotten egg odor doesn't take much you can detect that rotten egg odor and one thing you you, you probably I'm not I don't want to say probably you should train your workers to be aware of if they smell rotten eggs they need to, to leave that area until uh, more extensive monitoring can take place because if you smell that rotten egg that sulfury smell that could indicate the presence of hydrogen sulfide and our olfactory system at these very low levels, we can detect these very low levels. And some of you have heard me say this before, our, our, our olfactory senses gives us a good indication of what's bad for us. Normally, if it smells bad, if we don't like the smell of it, good chance it's not gonna be good for us. Uh, if, if it smells bad, it's better to leave the area, get the proper monitoring equipment in there, and, and conduct a proper monitoring protocol to identify what the exposure levels are, what the concentration levels are in those areas. Uh, at 10 parts per million, that's the OSHA 8-hour PEL. Uh, 50 parts per million, that is the short-term exposure limit for a maximum excursion of 10 minutes. Now we talked about short-term exposure limits earlier in the semester, and we talked about 15-minute excursions. Most, for most toxins, excursions are limited to 15 minutes, but there are some substances that would have uh, an excursion limit less than 15 minutes, like we have here at 10 minutes. There may be even may even be some substances that would have an excursion limit out to say 30 minutes. 
So that's where we, we go back to that SDS, the NIOSH, uh, the NIOSH information, the other resources that we've talked about. You know, know what we're dealing with, know what the limits are. Uh, at 100 parts per million, uh, and, and this is kind of insidious. This is an insidious aspect of hydrogen sulfide. Once we get to 100 parts per million, oh, let me back up. We said you can smell it at a very low level. Very low concentration, you can detect that odor. But also at a relative, relatively low level, at 100 parts per million, for most people, that concentration will paralyze their sense of smell and they can no longer smell it. So at 100 parts per million, if you're in that 100 parts per million concentration, if you're exposed to that for a period of time, you'll get to the point where you don't smell it anymore. And that's what's insidious about this. You get to the point relatively quickly where your nose is not giving you, is not working as a defense mechanism for you. You can't smell it anymore and you think everything's okay. Oh, I can't smell anything now, so it must be okay. Well, that doesn't mean it's okay. That means the olfactory, the olfactory organ, your ability to smell has been paralyzed. You've lost the sense of smell. And that's, again, very dangerous situation. Uh, also, at 100 parts per million, it can affect the eyes. And I've mentioned that it's a chemical asphyxiant, but can, it can also affect the eyes. Uh, at 320 parts per million, that's when we start seeing effects on the respiratory system and the respiratory process. I've also thrown in here at 800 parts per million, the lethal concentration uh, 50. Lethal concentration 50 value is 800 parts per million. If you remember from previous units, that means that at 800 parts per million in laboratory experiments, 50% of laboratory test animals died at this exposure. At 800 parts per million, 50% of the lab animals died. A thousand parts per million, and there can be individual differences. It should never get to this point. We should be monitoring and avoid this kind of circumstance. But if it does occur at a thousand parts per million, it can be as serious as an immediate collapse with just one breath, with just one whiff of the of the substance. You know, bad stuff. If you end up working in oil and gas, if you end up working in oil refinery. If you end up working in construction, uh, if you end up on, more on the environmental side, maybe you end up uh, uh, as a sewer treatment plant manager. These are, all, these are all locales or circumstances or work conditions where hydrogen sulfide is likely to occur. You gotta, gotta be on your toes when it comes to the potential for hydrogen sulfide. Just like carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide kills more people. Uh, carbon monoxide is more common than hydrogen sulfide. But I would put hydrogen sulfide, generally speaking, maybe at number two or three on my list. Um, and I think that's reflected in the fact that the, the basic monitoring devices that are available, they, they both do hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide. All right, let's move on. I could talk for 20 minutes. I'm, I'm kind of rushing through this. Hopefully it's not too fast, but uh, we got several more that I want to mention. I am going to speed it up a little bit. Uh, if you would like to learn any more about any of these substances, uh, there's a wealth of information available out there. Uh, phosgene gas uh, used as a chemical weapon in World War I. It is currently used in the plastics and pesticide industries as a raw material used in the process. It smells like fresh mown grass. Uh, the odor of phosgene is the smell of fresh mown grass. And one thing I, I, I need to mention, I mentioned that a lot of times uh, if it smells bad, that means it's bad for you, but there are substances that are very dangerous that do not have a dangerous that don't smell bad. Benzene, for example, uh, can have a maple syrup-like uh, smell. Most of us like the smell of maple syrup. It's an aromatic hydrocarbon. Aromatic hydrocarbon means it's a hydrocarbon that, that can smell good. And um, 
but the benzene's dangerous and many of those aromatic hydrocarbons that smell good also provide uh, or uh, represent serious dangers to workers. Uh, phosgene gas can be produced by chlorine containing compounds that are exposed to high temperatures. Uh, also like H2S and carbon monoxide, it is a chemical asphyxiant. It disrupts the respiratory process. Very low uh, time weighted average exposure limit, 0.1 parts per million. If a worker averages 0.1 parts per million or more over an eight hour workday, they are at the Pell or above the Pell if they're over 0.1. Uh, the immediately dangerous to life and health threshold is two parts per million. 500 parts per million, that's going to kill 50% of lab animals in laboratory studies. And I do have a video that I want to show you on phosgene. This is an industrial accident. Phosgene gas was used in the industrial process and there was a leak. And this, <clears throat> this video is from a government agency called the Chemical Safety Board, an excellent resource for uh, chemical hazard information, especially chemical hazard information applicable to the workplace. The Chemical Safety Board, they do recreations of accidents that have happened in oil refineries and other industrial facilities in accidents with chemicals primarily. But let's go ahead and watch this uh, video. Just don't, It's only three minutes long. The Bell Plant Small Lots Manufacturing Unit purchased phosgene in one-ton cylinders from an outside chemical company. The plant used the phosgene to manufacture five different pesticide intermediates. The cylinders were stored in a one-story, partially walled structure called a phosgene shed, which was open to the atmosphere. During use, the cylinders were connected to other equipment by flexible braided stainless steel hoses. Inside each hose was a liner made of Teflon, or PTFE. One hose used nitrogen to pressurize the cylinder pushing the liquid phosgene into the manufacturing process. An electronic scale recorded the weight of each cylinder. And when it was nearly empty, an alarm sounded in the control room. An operator then closed valves to the empty cylinder and opened valves to a second full cylinder. The stainless steel hoses to the empty container were purged of phosgene with nitrogen. The empty cylinder was then replaced with a new one on the weigh scale. On the day prior to the fatal phosgene release, operators were experiencing flow problems with one of the hoses and began switching between cylinders to avoid disruption to the chemical process. In the course of switching cylinders, the valve was closed on a partially full cylinder. However, the hose was not purged, allowing pressure to build as the liquid phosgene inside warmed up. Sometime between 1.45 and 2 p.m. on January 23rd, a worker was inspecting one of the cylinders when the pressurized hose suddenly burst. He was sprayed across his chest and face with a lethal dose of phosgene. Another worker was exposed to the deadly gas and a third was potentially exposed, but neither reported any symptoms. A total of two pounds of phosgene was released to the atmosphere. Small concentrations of the dangerous chemical were detected by monitors at the plant's fence line. The worker who had been sprayed with phosgene called for help and was transported to a local hospital. Four hours later, the worker's condition began to deteriorate rapidly, and despite medical treatment, he died a day after the accident.
A quick glimpse of the dangers of phosgene gas. Again, it is used in some industries and where it is used if uh, adequate process safety management procedures are not in place, where mistakes are made perhaps, there can be releases that can be deadly like that. But again, back to carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide kills more people than phosgene in the workplace and then also outside the workplace. That doesn't mean we can ignore phosgene and just focus on carbon monoxide. But don't forget about the dangers of, of carbon monoxide is, is the real point I'm making there with that comment. Uh, can also burn eyes and skin. Again, it's a chemical asphyxiant, but can, it can also affect other organs and organ systems of the body on contact. Hexavalent chromium. Uh, the common occupational exposure involves welding or hot metal work with stainless steel or the, uh, say a chrome plating process. Uh, lung cancer, irritation to the respiratory system if, if inhaled can occur. Uh, skin contact can produce lesions and permanent scarring can also damage the eyes. Uh, and I'm not going to show you this video on the hexavalent uh, or the effects of hexavalent chromium uh, to save a little time. But like I've said with any of these, if you would like to learn more about the, the substance, there's a lot of information available. Hexavalent chromium has received a lot of attention from, from safety professionals over the years. Um, and even in, in the eye of the public, it's received a lot of attention. If you remember the movie with Julia Roberts, Aaron Brockovich, um, the chemical that was the, the bad guy in that movie was hexavalent chromium. And chromium, a hexavalent chromium is, a, is an isotope of, of chromium. There are several different chromium isotopes, and this that uh, hex, this hexavalent form is the most dangerous. There are other forms that have dangers as well, but hex, the hexavalent form is considered most dangerous. Um, again, chromium is another example of one of these substances that uh, we, can, we can take chromium as part of our vitamin formulation. Or, uh, according to nutritionists, we need some level of chromium, but we don't need hexavalent chromium. Yeah, the chromium that's in our vitamins that we need for our uh, nutritional health is a different form of chromium. Um, but anyhow, let, let me go ahead and move on because we are uh, getting uh, short on time very quickly here. Uh, sodium azide or sodium azide, you'll hear it pronounced both ways. A white odorless solid material. This is a dust. Uh, when, when exposure occurs, we're normally talking about exposure to a dust. And exposure level is, is or exposure limits, very low. 0 0.3 milligrams per cubic meter. Um, this is the ceiling level that should not be exceeded. Any of us that drives a modern vehicle has the potential to be ex exposed to this substance. Uh, sodium uh, azide uh, is water reactive. When it reacts with moisture, it produces a toxic gas. Uh, also can be absorbed through the skin. Also reactive with some metals, it can explode. And it's in some automotive applications, it's used for a controlled explosion. You can, if I were in a face-to-face -face class, I'd ask you all if you knew what I was talking about. Some of you probably would. Uh, this is a substance that's used to activate an airbag when a car is involved in a, in a collision. Car is involved in a collision, airbag is activated. There's a small explosion of sodium azide that occurs inflating that airbag. And that's, you know, that's going back to what I said previously. Any of us has potential exposure if our airbag inflates, if we're involved, involved in a collision, uh, there may be exposure to this particular substance. Uh, it's also used as a preservative in hospitals and laboratories. Uh, and some additional information, a video, uh, CDC information, um, if you would like to have these links. And that's for any of the videos or any of the links that I'm not going into because of time constraints. 
I'd be happy to share them with you. But if you want to learn more about this substance, um, great thing about the internet, we're, we're only a few, a few clicks away from additional information. If you end up ended up working in any industry where this material was used, uh, you would certainly want to become more of an expert on this particular substance. And uh, this slide, we're talking of a generic category, various hydrocarbon compounds, compounds derived from petroleum, from wood, from carbon-based materials. Um, gasoline, diesel, lubricants are examples of hydrocarbons. Uh, the respiratory system is susceptible to damage from most hydrocarbon vapors. And this goes back to knowing your SDS, knowing the materials you're working with, and knowing what the potential effects are, taking measures to control exposure. Uh, these substances, most hydrocarbon substances, can have effects on the central nervous system, and many of them are carcinogenic, can be uh, uh, the causes of cancer. And I say most, there, there are hundreds of hydrocarbon compounds. Some are worse than others. But again, know what you're working with and, and know what measures need to be taken to protect ourselves and workers from those dangers. Also, uh, flammable vapors. At some point this semester, I'm going to do a, a, a quick video on the lower explosive limit, the upper explosive limit, and the flammability range. Uh, you'll see that in other classes, but that's one of that's a set of concepts that every safety manager should have uh, have uh, squared away an understanding of the flammability range. And the flammability range is, uh, uh, does have two components, the lower explosive limit and the upper explosive limit. And if you're dealing with hydrocarbon compounds, you need to, to know the flammability range of those carbons, uh, of those compounds, I'm sorry. If a spark is introduced or another ignition source is introduced and the concentration is within that flammability range, uh, combustion can occur, fire can occur. But you know, I'm gonna put one video together just on that and we'll don't know where I'm gonna fit it into, the, into our industrial hygiene class, but uh, I need to fit it in at some point. Uh, we also can run into a wide variety of what are referred to as halogenated compounds. A halogenated compound is a chemical compound that includes one of the halon gases or one of the halogens. The halogens and these are the common halogens that uh, we're most likely to encounter chlorine, fluorine, bromine, and iodine. Any compound that includes chlorine and fluorine and bromine especially potentially dangerous. Uh, chlorine is kind of like carbon monoxide. We take it for granted because it's fairly common. It's used as a, as a sanitizer in our water supplies. Fluorine is also added to water supplies uh, in limited amounts. But in the wrong amounts and wrong combinations, uh, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, and iodine can be dangerous. So we need to be careful any time we're dealing with com uh, chemical compounds that include any of these elements. It can have various impacts on the body, can be acutely fatal, can be immediately fatal. If you mix chlorine and ammonia, the gas that's produced can be immediately fatal. Uh, it goes back to what I've said, I think three or four times now, and probably 20 times so far this semester. Know what we're working with, Go to your SDS, go to the manufacturer, go to the toxic substance portal. Uh, these, are, these are elements that are found in a lot of products. Uh, you know, chlorine is found uh, as an element in a lot of products that we can purchase at the grocery store or tractor supply or Lowe's. So, but don't take it for granted. Don't be complacent when it comes to any compound that contains these elements. 
Uh, beryllium. Uh, inhalation of beryllium can lead to chronic beryllium disease and or lung cancer. Uh, OSHA developed their new standard that was implemented in 2017. Uh, beryllium is a lightweight, rigid metal found in many products and industrial processes. So if you're working in an, in an industry where there is beryllium, this would need to be on your radar as a substance of concern, a priority substance. Uh, certainly you want to comply with the OSHA regulations when it comes to beryllium, but more importantly, you want to protect your workers from uh, chronic beryllium disease. You want to protect them from lung cancer. This is the eight hour Pell. This is the 15 minute short term exposure limit. Notice we're measuring in micrograms, not, not milligrams, microgram. A microgram is one one millionth of a gram. And less than one one millionth of a gram uh, per cubic meter is the Pell. So doesn't take a lot of this particular substance to have harmful effects. And I don't have the, the physical effects like I had for some of the other substances. But I think this speaks volumes right here. Um, workers should not be exposed uh, to beryllium, if, if at all possible. Uh, silica, also really common. OSHA came up with new regulations also. Uh, it's, it would have been 2017 also. Uh, into 2018 was the actual implementation of the new silica standard that was applicable to the construction industry found in rock and concrete products. Uh, as long as it's not airborne, it's not a danger. But when it's disturbed and when microscopic particles are created, those microscopic particles can get into our deep lung tissue and it's like breathing in microscopic, microscopic glass. It can do physical, mechanical damage on our structures. It can result in cancer. It can cause breathing impairment. It can, it can cause our alveoli to no longer function properly uh, once certain levels are reached. Now this tends to be a, uh, be a substance that's primarily of concern when we're talking about chronic exposure, long-term exposure but there can be acute effects as well. Uh, there have been cases where workers receive a very high dose of silica dust in a very short period of time and have experienced very serious uh, health effects from that one time high dose exposure. But usually with silica, the effects of silica, it, uh, We'll talk, well, I'm saying too much. I'll talk more specifically about silicosis in the next video. The next video, we're going to talk about specific disorders, and we will talk more about silicosis. And we'll also talk about uh, uh, one of the famous uh, workplace catastrophes in U.S. history that involves silica yeah, in the next video. Asbestos fibrous mater material use useful as heat insulation and in a wide variety of products. Like uh, silica, it's only really a problem if it becomes airborne. If we can work around it, not disturb it, if it can be encapsulated, then uh, it's, it's not a major issue. But if it does become airborne, if the fibers are inhaled, it can result in asbestosis and lung cancer. Lead is a system toxin. It gets into our bloodstream. It affects our reproductive system. It affects our nervous system. Um, common exposure to lead uh, involves airborne dust. Tearing down an old home that has lead paint. Dust is created. Dust is generated. Uh, workers breathe in that lead dust. Uh, there are specific uh, OSHA requirements and protocols that must be followed if you have workers working with lead uh, containing materials. Same thing with asbestos containing materials. There are certain procedures and protocols that must be followed. Uh, when uh, when we had a bridge job, again, if, if you're not aware, I don't know if 
if I actually mentioned that I worked in the bridge construction industry, I think you probably gathered I worked in the construction industry, but it was bridge construction primarily. If we had to tear out an old bridge with lead paint, we would bring in a, a subcontractor specialist to do the lead abatement. They would put a big tent up over the entire structure, at least the area where they were working. They had all the equipment, they had the knowledge, the know-how that they needed to do it safely. Uh, we were on one job and the project manager wanted to save money and have our guys do the lead abatement. I talked him out of it because all I had to do was show him all of the, the steps that had to be followed uh, to be in compliance with the OSHA standard. So we ended up spending the money, bringing in the, uh, the specialist, letting them do the work. And we saved money by doing that. It was expensive, but if we had tried to do it ourselves, it could have been much, much more expensive. And we didn't have any of the equipment. We didn't have the, the, the hands-on knowledge for lead abatement, so we were better off subbing it out. Now, lead can also, we talked about inhalation of the lead dust. It can also be ingested we can uh, take it into our digestive system. Uh, health effects, I've already alluded to, wide ranging and serious. Um, at 20 micrograms per deciliter, this is a blood concentration. Uh, the concentration of lead in the exposed worker's blood. At this level of blood concentration, decreased cognitive function and fertility problems. It affects our ability to think, that affects our ability to reproduce at this level. At 20 to 40, attention deficit, reduced dexterity. We fumble around. We lose our manual dexterity. At 40 to 60 micrograms per deciliter, uh, headache, fatigue, sleep disturbance. At 60 micrograms, convulsions, coma, it can affect our kidneys and uh, develop uh, fibrous growth within our kidney tissues. And it's, it's not good stuff. Uh, so if you are in an industry where there is the potential for lead exposure, uh, I think the first step for you uh, would be the OSHA regulations pertaining to lead exposure and working with lead containing materials. But then you would want to do some additional research also. And if it was me, I would contact a, a, a specialist in uh, lead, a lead specialist, a lead exposure specialist uh, that would be able to provide proper guidance for your company and your crew uh, in those instances where there might be lead exposure. Don't mess around with it. All right, uh, 54 minutes, sorry about that. Again, think about it, that's just a little bit longer than a normal class period. Uh, but in this 54 minutes, we've talked about some of the more common chemical hazards. There are many more. The ones that I've highlighted are some that, that do result in a number of fatalities. Again, back to carbon monoxide, 44% of acute chemical exposure fatalities, it's carbon monoxide, that's the culprit. Uh, the others that we talked about were maybe not quite as, as deadly in, the, in terms of the number of fatalities, but they're common and they do have serious health effects. Now in your specific industry, you may have a whole different list that you end up working with. Um, but you'll probably end up working with these, but then you may have others as well that, uh, that you need to, to have greater knowledge about and you need to understand methods for controlling exposures and so on. Okay. To gain that additional knowledge once you're in those maybe specialized industries with specialized types of exposures, uh, hazard analysis, the evaluation process, using the resources that are available through the Centers for Disease Control, NIOSH, OSHA, OSHA Table Z is going to provide exposure limit information and the, the, the toxic substance portal from the CDC will provide more information than you're likely ever going to need uh, when you're in work environments where there are uh, different chemicals being used, different toxins that workers could be exposed to. All right, I'm about worn out. I'm about out of breath. Drink some water here. I will see you in the next video.